Now listen to me, you don't have to be in full-time Christian service, which means get your check from the church or a mission organization. You don't have to do that to tell a unique story for God. From the new campus of First Baptist Church in downtown Dallas, this is Pathway to Victory with best-selling author, Bible teacher, and pastor, Dr. Robert Jeffress. Hi, I'm Robert Jeffress, and welcome again to Pathway to Victory. The Bible represents a collection of amazing stories. But did you know that God is still writing stories, and He's writing those stories through you? Today, we'll continue our brand new series called Choosing the Extraordinary Life, God's Seven Secrets for Success and Significance. And during the next half hour, we'll see how these seven secrets emerge from the story of Elijah and how they apply to you. Discover your unique purpose on today's edition of Pathway to Victory. Too many of us settle for a listless life of mundane routine. We long to discover a greater purpose for our lives, but we don't know how. Dr. Robert Jeffress has an encouraging message for people looking for something more. God not only wants you to enjoy an extraordinary life, He has provided a roadmap for doing so. In my brand new hardcover book, Choosing the Extraordinary Life, I reveal God's seven secrets for a life marked by significance, satisfaction, and success. Request your copy of Choosing the Extraordinary Life today when you give a generous gift to Pathway to Victory. In the pages of this book, you'll learn how to discover your unique purpose wait on God's timing, influence your culture, and more. For anyone who wonders if there's more to life, God's Word reveals seven secrets for experiencing a truly extraordinary life. Contact Pathway to Victory today to request your copy of Choosing the Extraordinary Life. Write to P.O. Box 223-609, Dallas, Texas 75222. Yesterday, I came across a great definition of country music. Three chords and the truth. <laughs> that summarized most country music songs, doesn't it? Three chords and the truth. It reminded me of Carl Sandburg, the poet's definition of life. He defines life not in three chords, but in three words. Born, troubled, died. According to Sandberg, that's the whole of human existence. Born, troubled, died. One Chicago sewer worker expanded that definition a little bit as he described his life. He said, I dig the ditch to earn the money, to buy the food, to get the strength, to dig the ditch. Unfortunately, that's the cycle most people are trapped in in their daily lives. But God means more for us than simply that kind of meaningless existence. Jesus said in John 10:10, 10, 10, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And today we have come to that first and foundational secret for living a truly extraordinary life. And that is discovering your unique purpose in life. You know, the fact is your specific purpose in life can be described as the story God created you to tell the world. That's what your unique purpose is. It is that special story God has uniquely created for you to tell the world. But your specific story is connected to a bigger story that God is telling throughout the universe. So let's talk about that bigger story that you and I are a part of. God's general purpose for everybody who lives. If you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. 
God has a general purpose for everyone, but he has a specific purpose for your life that is a part of that larger purpose. Let's talk about God's general purpose for every person. Genesis 1:27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God created you and me to be image bearers of Almighty God. And that is through our lives, we are reflecting to the world that true enjoyment and satisfaction in life can only come from knowing and serving God. That is the general purpose that we have all been created for, to turn people toward God, to be a living demonstration of the satisfaction and joy that comes from knowing and obeying God. Theologians have summarized that purpose like this. Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's the reason we were created, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. When we talk about glorifying God, what we're talking about is making God look heavy, substantial to an unbelieving world. We were created to point people toward God. Elijah understood that truth. He understood that his whole existence revolved around demonstrating to an unbelieving world that the God of Israel was the only true God. We have been created to glorify God. But secondly, we've been created to enjoy God. Enjoying God is also a part of the reason for our existence. And that in itself gives glory to God. John Piper said once, God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. It is when we are happy in God, joyful. I don't mean giddy all the time, but I mean there is a joy in our life. That is when we glorify him. Psalm 1611 says, you will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. And when you look at Elijah, he's a case study and somebody who glorified God and also enjoyed God. Remember, Elijah was not a spiritual superman. He was a spiritual everyman. James 5, 17 says he was a man with a like nature as ours. He struggled with the same things you and I struggle with. Nevertheless, God used him in an extraordinary way. Let's look at Elijah's beginning. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. Now, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to King Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, surely there will be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Now, in this single verse, I want you to notice three things about Elijah. First of all, his name, his name. Literally, his name means Jehovah is my God. Jehovah is my God. Now, that's the name his parents gave him. Jehovah is my God. I want you to imagine for a moment what it would have been like to grow up having that be your name. Jehovah is my God. Can you imagine his friends coming over and knocking on the door and saying to Elijah's mother, can Jehovah is my God come out and play today? I mean, he grew up his whole life hearing Jehovah is my God. Jehovah is my God. No wonder when he burst on the scene in verse 1, he says, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand. He grew up with a God awareness, a God consciousness. Isn't it interesting how the characters in the Bible had significant names that mirrored their future? Elijah did that. He had an important name. Secondly, notice his home. It said that he was the Tishbite. He came from the town of Tishbe. But you know what was significant was not the geographical location of his home. It was the spiritual temperature in his home. Because what we know about Elijah's house is his parents taught him the word of God. We don't know anything about his parents, but we know they taught him the word of God. You say, how do you know that, pastor? Well, because of what he said to Ahab in this opening verse. He says, I say to you, it shall neither 
do, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. How did Elijah come up with that prophecy? He didn't just make it up on his own. Did you know he was quoting from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy when he said that? See, we think, well, Elijah lived in the Old Testament. The Old Testament had not been yet written. Well, some of it had already been written. The Pentateuch, Moses' writings had been written. And in Deuteronomy 11, verse 17, God had said to the Israelites, what would happen to them if they begin to worship other gods? In Deuteronomy 11, 17, God said, I would shut up the heavens so that there will be neither rain and the ground will not yield its fruit and you will perish quickly from the good land which the Lord is given you. Elijah knew the word of God. It was the foundation of his life. Parents, the most important thing you can do is to instill in your children a knowledge of God's word. You know, we only have our kids for 18 or so years, and they are gone so quickly. Look, your primary responsibility, this isn't popular to say, but it's true. Your primary responsibility is not for their scholastic development or their athletic development or their social development. Your primary responsibility is their spiritual development teaching them that the most important thing in life is knowing and obeying God. Thirdly, his manner. His manner. Elijah was not a man to mince words. I can only imagine what it was like for Elijah to stand in front of a hostile king, an unbelieving king, and deliver this condemning and politically incorrect word. You've had it, Ahab, until you shape up. It is not going to rain in this land forever. That took courage. But that was Elijah. He knew his purpose in life. That was Elijah. God had given him the general purpose that we all have of glorifying God. But his specific assignment was to deliver this hard message to a wicked and wayward nation. Now, before we discover how you can discover your story, your unique purpose in life, I want to talk for just a moment about the three benefits of discovering God's unique purpose for your life. Turn over, hold your place here, and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5, verses 15 to 17. And I want to read this from the Phillips paraphrase. This is Paul writing. Notice what he says here. Live life with a due sense of responsibility, not as men who do not know the meaning and purpose of life, but as those who do. Make the best use of your time, despite all the difficulties of these days. Don't be vague, but firmly grasp what you know to be the will of God. Knowing your purpose, the specific story you were created to tell, clarifies three challenges we all face in life. First of all, knowing your purpose clarifies your priorities in life. When you understand the specific story God created you to tell, it helps you arrange your priorities in life. When Paul says, make the best use of your time, literally he's saying, buy up the time. That is, purchase the very best things you can with your time. He's not talking about choosing between good and evil. We all know we're supposed to run from evil. But he's saying when you know your purpose, it gives you the ability to choose between the good things in life and the best things in life. When you understand what that purpose is that God has created you, it helps you to learn to say no to other good things, but things that don't contribute to your purpose. So knowing your purpose clarifies priorities in life. Secondly, knowing your priorities clarifies uncertainties in life. Paul said we ought to be wise when it comes to understanding God's will for our life. And when you face a difficult decision in your life, knowing your unique purpose is like a beacon that gives you direction in the darkness and even in the fog. But knowing what your purpose is can help clarify uncertainties and decisions that you make in your life. Thirdly, and this is so important, knowing your purpose clarifies difficulties in your life. When you understand your specific story you were created to tell, that gives you a prism through which to view even hard things that come into your life. 
How do you discover what the unique story is God wants to tell through you? Well, I want us to take that word story, S-T-O-R-Y. Use it as an acrostic that will help you remember five ways to discover your unique purpose in life. The S in story stands for start with scripture. Scripture, God's word is the beginning place, not the ending place, but the beginning place for discovering your unique story. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. Now, let's be honest. You can read the Bible from cover to the maps and uh, not find your specific profession in Scripture, unless you're into tax collecting, shepherding, or fishing. But if it's not those three, you're going to have a hard time finding your profession in Scripture. But reading the Scripture, saturating your mind with the stories of men and women whom God has used in a powerful way can be a great foundation for listening to God's voice when he speaks to you. Start with scripture. The T stands for talk to others. If you want to know your unique purpose, get wise counsel from other people. Proverbs 13 verses 10 and 20 says, wisdom is with those who receive counsel. He who walks with wise men will be wise. When it comes to understanding your unique purpose, God has placed around you people in very different roles who can be a great help in uncovering that purpose for you. You know, theologians and pastors often refer to a person's unique purpose as their calling. Have you heard that before? Their calling. One theologian describes calling as an inner desire given by the Holy Spirit through the word of God and confirmed by the community of Christ. When God calls people, and by the way, he doesn't just call pastors and missionaries. Every person is called by God for a unique purpose. And that purpose begins with an inner voice, the Holy Spirit of God, but it's confirmed by other people God places around you. When God calls you to do something, there's going to be confirming signs People that God places in your life who will tell you this is what you ought to be doing. The third component for discovering your purpose, the O, is obey your passions. If you want to know how you ought to spend your life, what's your unique way to tell God's story, ask yourself the question, what would I like to do? If money and education were no limit and I could do whatever I wanted to do, what would it be? You say, Pastor, ask yourself. See what's in your heart. Well, Pastor, don't you know what the scripture says? The heart is wicked and deceitful and who can possibly know it? You can't trust your desires, can you? Well, that's your heart before you become a Christian. But once you're saved, your heart gets transformed. And the closer you walk with God, the more your desires reflect God's desires for your life. Isn't that what we read just a few moments ago in Psalm 37, verses 4 and 5? Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will do it. You know, another word for desire is the word passion. If you want to know what your specific purpose and story is, ask yourself, what is the passion, the fire God has put in my heart? Frederick Buechner has written, the place God calls you is to the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Isn't that great? That's where God's calling you, where your passion and the world's need meet. Fourth, the R stands for recognize your gifts and your abilities. If you want to know your purpose in life, look at the areas in which you're gifted. Philippians 2.13, again in the Philip says, it is God who is at work within you, giving you the will, that means passion, and the power, that means gifts and abilities, to achieve his purpose. You hear what Paul's saying? God has given you not only a desire, but he's given you the gifts and the abilities to fulfill that desire. You know, we say to people all the time, 
Oh, you can, and we tell our children this, you can be whatever you want to be. No, they can't. No, they can't. Neither can you or neither can I. We can't be whatever we want to be, but we have the power to be whatever God wants us to be. If God has called you to something, he's given you the gifts to go along with that calling. Yes, I know. There are a few examples in the Bible where God has called somebody to do something outside of his area of giftedness, but that's the exception, not the rule. Usually, our gifting reveals our calling. Finally, the why in this acrostic story, the why stands for yield to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Yield to the leading of the Holy Spirit. You can start with scripture, talk to others, obey your passions, recognize your gifts, but there comes that moment when you have to say yes, Lord, to his leading and calling in your life. Romans 12, one to two says, I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. You have to yield to God's calling once you've identified it. Now, I know God gave me the interests that were needed at this time in the church's life to accomplish his purpose. And he's done the same for you as well. Now, listen to me. You don't have to be in full-time Christian service to tell a unique story for God. But whatever your day job is, your real job is to glorify God. And the specific way you're going to do that is through that passion and through the gifts God has given to you. Max Lucado, the writer and pastor, says it so well, a formula for discovering your purpose in life. He said, use your uniqueness, what you do, to make a big deal out of God while you do it. Every day of your life, that's where you do it. At the convergence of all three, you'll find your sweet spot. Discovering your sweet spot, your unique purpose in life, is the foundation for living a truly extraordinary life. Hi, I'm Robert Jefferson. Welcome again to Pathway to Victory. Let me begin with a personal question. In your quiet, private moments, do you ever find yourself thinking, there must be more to life than this? Oh sure, you're keeping busy, but deep in your spirit, perhaps you feel a longing for something more. Today, we're beginning a brand new series based on the life of Elijah, in which we'll discover God's seven secrets for success and significance. My message is titled, Choosing the Extraordinary Life, on today's edition of Pathway to Victory. Far too many of us settle for a life of mundane routine. Do you find yourself longing for something more? In his new book, Dr. Jeffress says, you don't have to be a spiritual Superman to break free of the daily grind. God is in the business of using ordinary people just like you and I to do his extraordinary work. In my new book, Choosing the Extraordinary Life, I reveal seven secrets that result in a life marked by significance, satisfaction, and success. In this book, you'll discover how to find your specific purpose in life, how to shorten your list of regrets, and you'll learn why waiting time is not wasted time, and more. A copy is yours when you give a generous gift to Pathway to Victory. Isn't it time to start living the story God wants to tell through you? One person empowered by the Word of God and the Spirit of God can truly change the world. Contact Pathway to Victory right now to request your copy of Choosing the Extraordinary Life. My friend, Dr. James Dobson, has written about 
the ordinary existence that most men experience, but you could take his words and certainly apply them to most women as well. He calls the ordinary life the straight life. Listen to his description. He said, the straight life for a working man is pulling our tired frame out of bed five days a week, 50 weeks out of the year. It's earning a two-week vacation in August and choosing a trip that will please the kids. The straight life is spending your money wisely when you'd rather indulge in a new whatever. It is taking your son bike riding on Saturday when you want so badly to watch the baseball game. It's cleaning out the garage on your day off after working 60 hours the prior week. The straight life is coping with head colds and engine tune-ups and crabgrass and income tax forms. That's a pretty good description of the straight life, the ordinary existence of most men and women. Perhaps deep down you want a life that is truly extraordinary, one that is making an eternal difference in the lives of people. But deep down you say, an extraordinary life for me, pastor, you don't understand. I'm retired, or I'm an accountant, or I'm a homemaker, or I'm a student. What eternal difference can an ordinary person like me make? Don't ever underestimate the power of an ordinary person to make an extraordinary impact. He did that with a man who lived 3,000 years ago. His name was Elijah. And he is the subject of our new study, Choosing the Extraordinary Life. Over these next weeks, we're going to discover Elijah's seven secrets for living a spiritually successful and significant life. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. To understand the world in which Elijah lived, we have to understand what was going on morally and spiritually in the country. You know, it's easy to say, it's easy to think, well, you know, back in biblical times, it was a lot easier to live for God than it is today. Today is filled with such sin and secularism. It's just too hard to live for God. Things were not as bad back then as they are today. And that's true. Things are not as bad today as they were back then. Things back then were worse than they are today. And if you don't believe that, just look at the spiritual debauchery, the idolatry that characterized the world of Elijah. Now, the book of 1 Kings begins with a funeral, and it ends with a funeral. It begins with the funeral of King David. Remember, David was the ultimate king of Israel. When David died, the downward slide of Israel began, and it began with his son named Solomon. Now, Solomon started out strong for God. He prayed for wisdom as a young 19-year-old king. His heart was wholly devoted to God. But then he disregarded the commands of God, and that began the downward spiral of Solomon. Look at 1 Kings 11, verses 1 to 4. Now, King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel, you shall not associate with them, neither shall they associate with you, or they will surely turn your heart away after other gods. But Solomon held fast to these in love. Let me say as strongly as I can, don't marry, don't date a non-Christian, because more often than not, they will turn your heart away from God. You know, my dad married my mom when she wasn't a Christian. He didn't know better. He was just untaught, new in the faith himself. And God overrode that decision. And occasionally God will do that. But the majority of time I've seen after 40 years in the ministry, it works just the opposite. You don't turn the heart of the non-Christian toward God. That non-Christian will turn your heart against God. It happens over and over. And that's what happened to King Solomon. Because of the women, not because they were foreign, it was because they worshiped foreign gods. 
Look at what happened in verse 4. For it came about when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. After Solomon died, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, became king, and the downward slide continued. There was a civil war that occurred in 922 B.C. Now, let me give you three minutes of Israelite history that will help you understand the Bible. In 922 B.C., there was a civil war that split Israel into two parts. There was the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom consisted of 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel. And because it had the majority of the tribes, it retained the name of Israel. Anytime you read in the Bible from 1 Kings 12 on the word Israel, it's referring to the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom had two tribes in it. One of those tribes was Judah, from which would come Jesus Christ. The southern kingdom became known as Judah. So you had Israel in the north, you had Israel in the south. Israel in the north had 19 kings, and they were all rotten to the core, every one of them. They were all evil. The southern kingdom, Judah, had 20 kings during its brief history. 12 of them were evil, 8 of them were good. Elijah lived in northern Israel. He was in the kingdom of Israel. That's where he ministered. And the downward slide of the northern kingdom that began with Solomon intensified under a king named Ahab. Ahab was the king when Elijah lived and ministered. Ahab, it says, did more to provoke the God, God to anger than any king before him. Why was he so ungodly? Part of it had to do with his heritage. If you don't think parents make a difference in their children, look at what happened to Ahab. 1 Kings 16, 25 says, Omri, that is Ahab's father, did evil in the sight of the Lord, and he acted more wickedly than all who were before him. But then came Ahab. If you thought Omri was bad, look at what Ahab did. He multiplied the sins of his father. Now, it's interesting. Omri's reign was seen as unsuccessful. The 60-plus years he was king, the nation was filled with bloodshed. The economy went to pot. When Ahab became king, things turned around. Because of trade deals with Phoenicia, the economy picked up and the people were happy. Everybody, if you ask the average Israelite, thought things were going splendidly in the nation of Israel. It could well be said in Israel, there was a chicken in every pot and a chariot in every garage. People were happy with what was happening in the country. But you know what? God does not judge the success of a nation by its GDP, its gross domestic product. God judges a nation by its GBP, its godly behavior product. And by that measurement, the nation was in a serious deficit position. The nation was sliding downward spiritually. That intensified in under Ahab. First of all, because of his ungodly father, but also because of his ungodly wife. The reason Ahab provoked the Lord to anger more than anyone before him was because of his wife. Now, I know some of you ladies are thinking, that's right, Pastor, blame it on the women. Blame it on the women. No, it wasn't because she was a woman. It was because she was a pagan. She was a foreign wife who worshiped a foreign god, and she brought the worship of that foreign god, Baal, into Israel. Jezebel made a sport of hunting down the prophets of Jehovah God, as we'll see in the weeks ahead. But the thing that angered God most about Jezebel was the worship of Baal. And that downward slide of Israel that began with Sol Solomon intensified under Ahab, it finally cultivated, culminated in the worship of Baal. Who was Baal? It's interesting, the worshipers of Baal did not deny the existence of Jehovah God. They simply said Baal was greater than God. In fact, his name means Lord or owner. Baal was thought to be the God of the sun, of rain, of fertility, and climate change. But what was particularly odious in the nostrils of God was the way in which they worshiped Baal. They worshiped him through sexual perversion, through self-mutilation, and 
through child sacrifice. Evil was running rampant and unchecked throughout the nation. And at that particular time, God raised up his representative, a man named Elijah. It's interesting when we look at Elijah, he was no spiritual superman. James 5, 17 says that he was a man with a like nature as ours. He was an ordinary person. He had the same battles you and I have. He battled with depression, despair, temptation, with doubts about God. Nevertheless, God used him in an extraordinary way to make a difference in his nation. Why was that? I want you to notice three qualities of Elijah. First of all, Elijah was a man of passion. He burned hot. He burned hot for God. We find that in the opening words where he just appears out of nowhere on the scene. Look at 1 Kings 17, 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Now that took guts to come before a pagan king and a pagan queen who loved to kill Jehovah's prophets. To Elijah, Ahab and Jezebel were just like blades of grass that blow a little while in the wind and then die. But Elijah... He wasn't a servant of Ahab or Jezebel. He was a servant of the eternal God. And he was consumed with that passion to make that God known to the entire world. Elijah was extraordinary because he got out of the world's parade. He wasn't going the way every other person in the world was. He wanted to be different. He wanted to stand for God. And it was that passion for God that caused God to use him in an extraordinary way. Elijah was a man of passion. Secondly, he was a man of purpose. He was a man of purpose. And Elijah understood he had one reason for living, and that was to make God known to as many people as possible. In fact, you find that in his name, Elijah. The name Elijah that his parents bestowed upon him literally means Yahweh is God. And because he knew what his purpose was, it gave him great courage. He didn't fear anyone. Not some wicked king or his wife. He didn't fear anyone because he knew he served the Lord. You know, knowing your purpose can give you great purpose in your life. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, don't fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Elijah lived his life for an audience of one. He was a man of purpose. Thirdly, Elijah was a man of prayer. That's one of the great secrets of his extraordinary life. In James 5, the half-brother of Jesus said, the effective prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. That's James 5, 16. But then in the next verse, to illustrate an effective man, a righteous man who accomplishes much through prayer, he uses Elijah as the example. Look at verses 17 and 18 of James 5. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it didn't rain on earth for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. The key phrase is, he prayed earnestly. What does it mean to pray earnestly? It doesn't mean you squeeze your folded hands so tight that the blood drains out of them. That's not what it means. Literally, in Greek, it says he prayed with prayer. In other words, prayer was a regular part of Elijah's life. The Bible says that's how we're to pray. We're just to keep on praying. You know, just like breathing. Nobody has to tell you to breathe, do they? That comes naturally. That was Elijah. Praying was as natural for him as breathing was. And that's one reason that God used him in such a powerful way. Passion purpose, prayer, those were the foundation stones of Elijah's life and ministry. You know, somebody has said that one person, one courageous person with purpose makes a majority. One courageous person with purpose makes a majority. That was true of Elijah. That's true in our day as well. 
One courageous person with, pers with, with purpose makes a majority. Tomorrow, we're going to be acknowledging the anniversary of the worst terrorist attack in American history, September the 11th, 2001. But on that day, there was one person with courage and purpose who made a difference. Peggy Noonan writes about his story. This man was known as the man with the red bandana. His name was Wells Crowther. Wells Crowther. When Wells was a little boy, his dad bought him his first suit. And he gave him a white handkerchief to put in the breast pocket of that suit. He also gave him a red bandana to keep in his back pants pocket. He said, son, one of these is for show, the other is for blow. <laughs> well, Wells Crowther carried that red bandana with him for years. As a young man, he became a junior associate for Sandler O'Neill in New York City, but officed on the 104th floor of the South Tower of the World Trade Center. On the morning of September the 11th, Wells Crowther felt that building shake. He felt that uh, terrible explosion that occurred floors below him. Earlier in his career, whenever he would pull out that red bandana, his associates would kid him about that red bandana. He said, don't laugh. With this red bandana, I'm going to change the world. That morning, he changed the world with that red bandana. When he felt the impact of that jet that ripped out floors 78 through 86 in the South Tower of the World Trade Center, Wells took that red bandana from his back pocket and put it around his face. He immediately went down the stairwell, went down to the 76th floor, where he found a group of people huddled together, some of them badly hurt and bleeding. One woman was so injured she couldn't walk, so Wells picked her up and he led the entire team down 18 more floors until they found clear air. Wells Crowther with that red bandana around his face then went back up to the 70th, 76th floor and he led another group down and then another group down and then another group to safety. Nobody knows how many rescue missions Wells Crowther went to that day. But when his body was found six months later in the lobby of the South Tower of the World Trade Center, his body was there with other firemen who had given their life to rescue people. The only way they were able to identify his body was he was wearing that red bandana. He made a difference. You know, when that jet struck that World Trade Center, Wells could have very easily said, I'm getting out of here. I'm going to save my life for the sake of my family. But he knew he couldn't do that. He had a purpose. And that purpose was to rescue as many people as possible. God's given us the same mission. You know, we are living in a world that is deteriorating before our very eyes. It's getting worse and worse. And worse, one day, the Bible says, this entire world is going to be consumed in fire and destroyed. There is only one way of escape from this world, and it is through faith in Jesus Christ. For those of us who have found that way of escape in Jesus Christ, we can just hunker down, try to protect ourselves and our family as we wait for the end to come, but that's not what God's told us to do. He said, I want you to rescue as many people as possible before I come back. God has given us a rescue mission. And only when we understand that eternal purpose God has for us and build our lives around that purpose, only then will we transform an ordinary existence into an extraordinary life.